This video is about how to conduct a trial in the smoke lens court. And to discuss the topic with us today is Mandy Jassy. And uh, just to give you my background, I'm a lawyer in uh, Ontario, also called to the bar in two other jurisdictions, but I'm also a deputy judge for 21 years in Richmond Hill. And I want to narrate in this uh, video program the typical issues that arise in conducting a trial in the Smoke Lens Court. So to ask the questions, I have Mendy Jassy here, and Mendy, good to have you here today. Thank you. And I will hear from you the questions that would arise in your mind, and you'll be a lawyer very soon, so that you want to know what happens in the courtroom. Yes, my first question, what are the major steps in a trial? The trial begins with an opening statement, which is made by the lawyer, if there's a lawyer, but if you go on your own, you have a right to go on your own as well. And there are many people who appear in the small claims court who are not lawyers, but they appear for themselves. And they have to open the trial by explaining to the judge in the opening statement what is it they want from the court. And for the lawyer, more importantly, it's important to identify the cause of action, the legal reason, if you like, for being in the court and saying to the court that I want a judgment on that particular issue. The second is the oath is taken by the witnesses as they go. Then there is the plaintiff witnesses, cross-examination of those witnesses by the opposing counsel. Then there are defendant witnesses and the cross-examination by the plaintiff counsel. Then there's a summary made by the two parties, each one summarizing what is it that uh, they want to submit to the court in terms of what they heard in evidence and how that evidence will be you know, applicable to, to take the position that they want to take in the courtroom for the judge to make a decision on. And then the judgment by the judge. That's the sequence of the major events in the trial. Mm -hmm. So how is an oath administered? Uh, usually it's a Bible on which they place the hand and the clerk of the court will say, do you take the oath that you say the truth? nothing but the truth and I think the person would say yes and they are under oath so to speak in different words once the oath is taken if you tell a lie it happens to be a lie and is found it will be perjury it's a serious criminal offense so the oath is given to the witness and and then he will give the evidence but if you're not Christian and prefer an affirmation then the affirmation is taken by the person, which has the same effect in the law, that if a person makes a false statement, then it could be penalized with a, a perjury trial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do you make an opening statement? The opening statement is uh, summarizing what I call the cause of action. The lawyers, uh, you uh, Having studied law, you understand what a cause of action is. But essentially, it is identifying what is it that gives you the right to come to the court, in different words. It is because something happens and you're unhappy about it, does not give you a right to seek legal remedy in the court system. The idea of a cause of action and narrating it within the framework of a trial, which you put into a claim, is to explain that there is a legal reason why you're in the court. For example, you have a contract which was breached. You had a tort, which the lawyer would understand, but for the average citizen, it is a wrong to a person, for example, driving. You hit somebody, and you have committed a tort. And some wrongdoing to a person is a cause of action that gives you a right to come to the court and look for the remedy. So a cause of action that must be identified. The trial is not about who is good and bad. Is a trial about, in a civil trial, it's very important to recognize it's about what is it that went wrong that gives you a right to look for a remedy in the court system. And then how should the lawyer ask questions in an examination in chief? The, 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 in examination in chief, it's important to, to keep in mind that you want to narrate the story preferably in the way it flows, the way the events took place. So you ask questions 
in an open-ended fashion what happened on this day. And if the witness uh, has forgotten to say something, you, you bring it to his attention. Did this happen on this day? But you do not ask questions which are leading questions. That means, do you not remember that this happened on this day? There's a leading question pointing indirectly to the witness that he ought to give an answer, which in fact the lawyer is proposing to him that he ought to say, which is not usually appropriate in the examination in chief, as it is called. So when the first lawyer who brings his witness as a plaintiff has a witness who wants to tell the story, he should be narrating the facts as, you know, basically through the questions of the lawyer who has the sequence in his mind as to identifying how the events will result in displaying the cause of action. That's the art of presenting your case when you are a plaintiff counsel. How does one cross-examine? So once the witness is given the evidence in terms of his possession, then the next question is the opposing counsel or opposing party must ask questions or has a right to ask questions. You don't have to, but if you want to, you can. And those questions are based on identifying the issues which the defendant or the opposing party wants to bring forward to illustrate their point of view. In other words, each person in the trial is trying to bring forward the best story they want to present, not necessarily what the other party wants to say. So if the person has not brought forward any facts or brought over facts which you disagree with, then the purpose of cross-examination is to zero in and identify the issues that you want to check up, check on or, or basically get them to admit statements that you want them to admit. And that is the purpose of cross-examination. So you have a much bigger latitude in pinpointing the issues when you ask questions on the cross-examination than you would in the examination in chief. Okay. And how does one make a summary of the trial? The summary of the trial is a summary of the facts as the two lawyers have heard. So usually it's the lawyer for the plaintiff who will summarize first and say, this is my particular set of facts that I heard. And he had the opportunity to hear the facts from both the sides, and but even then, each counsel is representing their own respective clients and they have their own perspective from which they saw the evidence. So having heard the evidence that all of the parties heard, including the judge, he's summarizing the issues from his point of view as to how those facts should be perceived from the plaintiff counsel point of view and how those facts will be applicable to support the cause of action that he brought forward to the court. And the opposing counsel will do the same thing. The same set of facts that were narrated in the trial and each witness who was cross-examined would be pointed out with respect to the summary by the, the defendant counsel and he will summarize his position at the end of the trial to say that that is what he heard and that is how the fact should be perceived by the judge so that from his point of view the judge should reach the conclusion. So, so I think that he is essentially summarizing the facts that will support their respective positions that they set on the opening of the trial. And that summary is a summary. This is not an opportunity to repeat all the facts as some counsel do. It's not a time to repeat the whole story. It's a time to summarize and give the judge a perspective of your position from your point of view. That is what the summary is all about for the two lawyers to present. So how does a judge decide? The judge will normally recite the facts. Sometimes there is a need that the facts are not very clear even after the presentation after the cross-examination, and the judge has a right to make a finding of the facts. He will say, I found it as a fact that when there's a dispute that this thing did happen in this particular way, and therefore this particular finding of fact is the right of the court, and, and he will find those facts, then he will summarize the law as it applies in this particular situation, and then 
the application of the facts with the law helps the judge and the court to then, then present the position and render a judgment. The judgment uh, will be a decision of the final decision of the event, which commences with the pleadings and comes to trial and having heard the facts and, and uh, the trial, the judge is making a decision which is binding on all the parties. So that's basically what happens. And I think the summary of that whole decision that is presented very often verbally, or he could have a written judgment as well. Then he would adjourn the matter and then send a written judgment. But most of the time, in a small claims court, the judgment is given orally with the narration of the facts, the law, and the decision. The final decision is then written out in what is called endorsement on a piece of paper which can be given to the two lawyers and they can uh, basically then give it to their clients and becomes binding at that moment in time. And is this judgment immediately enforceable then? Technically it's enforceable immediately subject to the right of appeal to bring it to a higher court, divisional or divisional court, mm -hmm. for the purpose of a, a, an appeal. And if the amount of the judgment is more than 500, then the it is appealable, otherwise not appealable in a small claims court. So that uh, is basically the way the judgment is rendered and the trial is conducted. That's very helpful. That's great, Mandy. Thank you for all the questions, and I hope the audience enjoyed watching the video in terms of how to conduct a trial, and uh, there will be more videos that will prepare. So watch us on the video channel, my website, jchohan.ca under resources and videos, and hope to see you again. Thank you.